Hello everyone and thank you for attending this webinar. Today's presentation topic is guided surgery. Now, in my training center we place a large amount of implants per year and I have myself been performing implant surgery for quite a few years now. Yet, last year, in my practice, the implants placed without the use of a surgical guide were the exception. Now, why is that? What is the benefit? Well, in the case of single implants, the answer is rather obvious. We can be as precise as we never were, while being as little invasive as possible. Using guided surgery, using a robust system such as DioNavi, I can be sure that anybody on my team will place a given implant just in the same place as I would, and that is priceless. In fact, I can, I can be sure that I will myself place the implant in the right place. It's not uncommon for someone just starting guided surgery to be impressed by just how far they would have placed the implant freehand from the position that guided surgery suggests. You see, using guided surgery means that the implant will be just right on a cingulum, that there will be space left for papillae, no need for cementing, if you prefer screw retained teeth, as I do. No implants exiting on the vestibular, compromising aesthetics. No implants far too palatal. As you know, they will compromise speech, they will compromise function. It also means no stress. No stress for you, because there is seldom the need for intraoperatory decisions, since most of the time we only need to well, stick with the plan, and uh, no stress for your patient. On this particular system, on the Onave system, the advised very low drilling speed will result in the noiseless procedure. Also, it has no need for cooling, meaning no need for suction. And of course, no flap means less blood. All of this results in a truly bearable experience for the patient. In all of these, your patients understand very well and is often an excellent marketing point. In fact, I am dealing with young doctors uh, a lot and guided surgery is just the perfect way for doctors to stand out in the market today. A more experienced clinician that has already made a name for himself will for sure communicate to his patient the large number of implants accumulated during his many years of experience. There's nothing wrong with that. Very hard to top it. But today, a young clinician can make the difference in obtaining high levels of predictability by using a system such as DO Navi. Very hard to top this as well. The case I'm about to show you next is a perfect case to start with guided surgery. A simple, straightforward case. This is a case that I could easily perform freehand unless I wanted, I wanted it absolutely perfect, which I did, because this was my dad. You see, my dad does not like dentists one bit, so I wanted a system that could be very reliable and, of course, minimally invasive. You can see that we have nice, curtinized soft tissue, plenty of bone available, a deep vestibulum. So, apparently, we have no real need for soft tissue management, meaning we don't need to raise the flap. If we did, we could reposition the keratinized tissue or perform a vestibulum deepening procedure, such as vestibuloplasty or free gingival graft. So I started this case by performing a CBCT, a CBCT scan, where upon examination, there was an abundance of hard tissue to be found. A large amount of bone means that we can't place our implants completely dictated by the final prosthesis. On a case like this, we are not in need for augmentation procedures. And also, if our implants are completely placed inside medullar bone, comprised between cortical bone on the vestibular and the lingua, this means that this surgery is going to be very predictable. Drilling against cortical bone, as we do, for instance, on post-extraction implants, can lower the predictability of the surgery because our drill tends to take the path 
of least resistance and slide off the dense bone. The Unavi team has addressed this problem with the introduction of their special kit where one can find special burrs designed to perform an osteotomy on dense steep bone. In this case, we also have teeth, so we are going to use a tooth supported guide, which is a very precise method. Next step was to acquire an intraoral scan of both arches. This is done with an intraoral scanner, and in partially identical cases, it can be hard to obtain a complete mesh closure. If that is the case, or if you don't have an intraoral scanner, you can get impressions from both jaws and send them to Dio. Of course, the distortion caused by the impression procedure, the impression material contraction, the cast expansion, the bubbles on the surface, etc., is something to take into account. This is particularly true when dealing with periodontal patients or patients wearing braces. Impressions from these cases are much inferior to the results that an intraoral scanner can obtain. We then start a collaboration with Dio, where we suggest the implant placement, and then rectify, if needed, the proposed treatment by their team. Once we agree about everything, in a few days you will receive a box. Inside you will find a surgical protocol with a surgical sequence to be used, including the depth, diameter and offset for each implant. You will also find a surgical report and a drilling protocol that is, detailed documentation that will ensure you have all the adequate information to proceed with the surgery. Also inside are the planned implants, the guys themselves, the custom abutments, the teeth, and in the event that you don't want to load your implants immediately, the cover screws. So I'm checking the fit of this guy, as you can see by the windows on the guide, and the adaptation is just perfect. The first drill we should be using is this tissue punch. It is actually a very small tissue punch, very minimally invasive. Sometimes though, we need to remove the guide to ensure all soft tissue was removed, despite the next bird being completely able to remove it as well. I don't use irrigation for this. The second bore is designed to flatten the ridge by removing bone. And I am using the first mark as a reference because it indicates the 9mm offset, which is the distance from the top of the implant, from the crest of the implant, to the guide tube stop. I am using high rotation along with copious irrigation, making sure that we remove this bore quite a few times from the guide tube in order to remove the bone debris that may be present. We irrigate inside the canal between burrs every time. We then proceed with this 5 mm in length burr. This is because we need to ensure contact at all times between the guide tube and the bone. It also helps to create vertical space for the subsequent burr since we are working on the posterior side of the mouth. The inner sleeve is required to use the 2 mm drill. Here you can see me using it without irrigation, drilling at low speed, always irrigating between burrs. Now, for the 2.7 burr, again, we start with a shorter burr and proceed to use a longer size. We will be placing regular size implants here, and what we need to make sure is to align the prominence of the guide with the mark on the mountain. This will ensure that an internal hexagon side is facing the vestibular. We are using a 9mm fixed offset mounter, so no need to worry about depth. We are at the correct depth when the mounter stop hits the guide stop. So here we have it, a fairly simple surgery that we have replicated on the remaining implant sides. Since we are dealing with posterior teeth this time, I chose not to load this case. So no need to create space for abutments, which is achieved by using a special bird. Despite being apparently easy, case selection for your first case is of particular importance. Many times, clinicians that have limited experience, limited experience with guide systems, 
ask advice for complex cases and propose the use of a guide, hoping that uh, the use of this technology can transform a challenging case into an approachable one. What you really should be doing is select a case like this one, cases where teeth have mobility, unusual anatomy, post-extraction, sibili resorbed reeds, etc. are probably better left to be treated with a freehand approach if your experience with guided systems is limited. If you are experiencing guided surgery, on the other hand, you will surely benefit greatly from a very precise surgery on complex cases. When considering full large cases, we need to once again ask ourselves what is the benefit of a guided approach? In the last case, in single implant cases, we are using a technology that the patient understands and many times it's the patient himself who demands a guided treatment. This is also true for full large cases, if we are going flapless whenever the case allows it. Being minimally invasive is very important for your patients and this means that it is very important for your practice. I have the privilege of teaching for a living and being your students all day allows me to be in touch with their worries. Someone who is fresh out of college always struggles to open a practice near someone more experienced. This is because more experienced colleagues will make sure the patient knows how they have been placing implants all the time since forever. And all of this can be very reassuring for the patients. But what these colleagues are really saying is no need to worry. Uh, I surely won't fail in your case because I have placed so many implants that I have refined and perfected my craft to a level that allows me to always place my implants wherever I want. But uh, now, for the first time, younger clinicians have the opportunity to say to their patients that despite not having the same amount of clinical experience, it is more likely that your implant will end up in the perfect plan position using this technology than relying on free hand surgery, as experienced as they might be. And that is a game changer. So in this first case I will show you, we are using probably the simplest and one of the best methods. Here we have constructed a device that once anchored to the palate, allowed us to place our implants through the gingiva and into the bone flapless. This is certainly spectacular for the patient, minimal pain, bleeding, swelling, precise implant placement and immediate loading on a hard case. Brilliant. But for this treatment to be an option, there are some things we need to assure. Particularly, we need to make sure that we have enough restorative space. What does that mean? Well, to accommodate the hybrid prosthesis, we will need 10 millimeters for the central incisor, 2 millimeters for the multi-unit, and 3 millimeters for the bar. 
Now, these values may change a little bit depending on the actual case, but what is certain is that we, if we don't grant our prosthodontic space, typically the dental technician will obtain space by reducing thickness where possible, usually on the part, and thus making the given rehabilitation prone to break. There are cases where we need more than those 50 millimeters for sure, which are all those cases where the patient exposes the gingival when smiling. This can be due to several reasons, such as hypermobile lip, short lip, maxillary bone excess, etc. But the solution is the same. We need to reduce bone. And also to be taken into account with possible implications at the level of bone reduction are the need for lip support, the incisal edge position from an aesthetic and phonetic standpoint, contours and emergence. If we select other types of restoration, such as zirconia, then we will be needing less space, but still a minimum of 12 millimeters should be assured. In this particular case, we have 15 millimeters from the bone crest to the incisal edge and the low smile line. So we went for this approach, which contemplated no bone reduction. We have plenty of keratinized thick soft tissue, so going for an approach that uses a tissue punch is perfect, since we don't need to perform any kind of mucogingival surgery. You'll notice that we have six holes instead of four, but we are going for an all four procedure. This is because in this particular case, we decided to stabilize this guide, designed and printed by us, by using the special kit by Dio. And this brilliant kit, and I really think it's brilliant, you'll find a dedicated kit for the full arch approach. It includes long burrs, fixation pins, which we are using on the vestibular side to ensure that the prosthesis does not move, and that is pr properly uh, adapted to the plate. We actually included a couple of anchor pins that use the same diameter as any burr on this kit, and thus you see six holes. The two posterior holes are not for implant placement. They will only be used to improve the, this device's fixation. In this slide, you are now seeing that the posterior osteotomies have been performed and a couple of anchor pins are in place. On the interior, two implants have been placed and we are using special components destined to secure the guide to the implants for maximum precision during implant placement of the angled posterior implants. DU includes three offset sizes on their special kit. We are using the 10.5 mm offset. Offset is the distance, once again, from the tip of the implant, from the crest of the implant to the stop on our bars. If we have more soft tissue, we need to augment this offset. If we need to place our implants deeper, we need to augment our, our offset as well and use larger bars. Also, if our guide tube does not fit between two teeth, we may have to raise it above the teeth, therefore using a higher off offset. Here we have our implants placed as minimally invasive as possible. In the second case, we have a patient that had a fixed rehabilitation of the maxilla 12 years ago, and now these implants are failing. Also, she's smoking two packs per day and has diabetes. So I didn't want to raise a flap here, as some of these cases have a hard time with wound healing. This was very easy to communicate with the patient. We explanted the failing implants, and you are seeing the patient four weeks later with basically the same bone panorama, but with healed soft tissue. Also, you might notice that there is not really much room for new implants. So being precise is imperative, and this patient also demanded immediate load. This is one of the reasons why I tend to place a minimal number of implants. I have seen way too many full arch cases that end up with complications down the road. And usually, when complications arise, being perimplantitis, loss of the implants, etc., it usually affects all of the implants and not only a single implant. So if we are dealing with a maxilla where eight, plant, eight implants were used, we are going to end up with eight big holes. A different scenario is usually what we find with all-on-four cases, where typically finding 
intact bone on the adjacent areas is less a less impossible task. Some all on four cases exist, though, where anchored implants on the piriform apertures may lead to oroandral communications where the implants are lost. What you see in this slide is a mucosupported guide. We have moved the pin position from the vestibular in the last example to the palate in this example. This has some advantages. The palatal mucosa healed very well, and no hematoma is created, unlike the vestibular pin insertion, because we are perforating no muscle. Also, the palate does not swell, so this seems to be a very comfortable solution. You'll notice a couple of windows on the posterior here. These allow us to check if the guide is perfectly adapted. Notice how we made use of the integrated implant, and by the way, this is a, an uncommon situation where one of the implants remains healthy to help stabilize the guide. We superimpose an implant against the integrated implant digitally and try to mimic the multi-unit position, not ending very far from the ideal. We enlarge the guide hole just enough so that we could place an abutment and then connect it with the guide to maximize its stability. This guide is secured in place with fixation pins by Dio. We placed the anterior implants first and then we proceeded to immobilize them using Dio special kit. And this is the final picture of what could be a much more traumatic case. Yet another flapless case in the maxilla. A genetic somewhat unusual anatomy combined with the misfortune of a car accident and an experienced surgeon led to the placement of these implants on not the ideal location. One of these implants actually was displaced inside the nose and went into the digestive tract. The patient was somewhat scared of additional surgeries, but willing to try a flapless approach. You'll notice that some of these implants can be saved, but we are going to leave one implant submerged as its emergence would occupy a big portion of the palate. An additional anterior implant actually had to be placed vestibularly so that the final prosthesis wouldn't occupy too much space palately and uh, we would end up with an, an even distribution of the fixtures ensuring no cantilevers are present. So the plan was to leave an implant uncovered, place another one on the anterior area and uncover all the others. Because the axes of two of the implants were confluent, we had to design two guides. One destined to place the anterior implant and another one which purpose it was to uncover the distal second quadrant implant. This is the first guide. It allows to uncover three implants using a tissue punch and to place an additional one. After they have been exposed, we connected prosthetic components to the guide as a way to achieve maximum stability. Next step was implant placement. And we could, we could have performed some kind of soft tissue mobilization here, but again, this was not the ideal time for a patient. So we postponed this to another time. Maybe a fruit gingival graft will be the elected surgery in the future. Here is our second guide. Again, we will use it to uncover a distal implant and capture the prosthesis. This case highlights the importance of adequate planning, putting emphasis on the vestibulopalatal angulation. It also shows us how to use a guide not only to place implants, but to uncover them with maximum precision. Here is another case where we used a flapless approach and a very restored mandible. We had restorative space, so we went flapless. Notice how restored this mandible is. The mental foramen are very superficial. In order to avoid this, typically, we have to move our incision lingually, far away from the crest, so that we have no chance of creating prestigia. However, the tissue in that area is typically very thin non-keratinized and mobile. This makes it very prone to exposure and wound healing complications, which are even more impactful if we consider that the vast majority of these patients 
the vast majority of the patients presenting this bone architecture are older patients. So going guided here is just smart because all that we are doing is a minimal punch on the patient's mandible. The right anterior posterior angulation of the implants is something that freehand surgery may fail to achieve without the use of some kind of a guide. This has implications that range from the need of angled multi-units in the anterior implants if they become too vestibularized, or worse, phonetic complications and space limitation complaints because of a bulky prosthesis if they become too lingual. Here we had already taken this into account when playing the implant's position. Now this approach, like every approach, is not without any downsides. An obvious one is lack of soft tissue manipulation. This means that we lose the opportunity to place our thick, keratinized tissue where it matters the most, many times having the need to perform soft tissue grafting further down the road. In this case, we used a CBCT scan from the patient and also a CBCT from the patient's existing denture. We made sure that it was adequately realigned so that we could obtain a fitting, exact replica of the patient's denture, and then we have imported it into our workflow. This is a simple and convenient workflow, although not the most precise. We could also use an intraoral scanner for this, but it is often more time-consuming and overall more difficult to obtain a good prosthesis reproduction because we need to capture both the outer surface and the, and the inner surface of the prosthesis. Another way would be using an extraoral scanner. And this will be a very precise and simple option. How about those cases where we need to perform some kind of bone reduction? In my practice, this represents the majority of the cases. To address these cases digitally, we have been using bone-supported guides. These are devices, guides, that lay against the bone. Now, from a technical standpoint, their design can be quite complex and time-demanding. You see, if you are using a CVCT scan like I am, you'll notice that in the maxilla and even in the mandible, the bone representation of the visualizer may be composed of the bone surface, interrupted with small, some holes. This is less of a problem in the mandible because of its density. Because it uses a different technology, a CAT scan may actually deliver a better result. If you encounter this situation, then what you will be needing to do is segmentation. That is, to manually indicate the software what is and what is not bone. This process is sensitive and prone to error since it is a human-mediated process and also quite tedious. There are some companies that allow you to delegate this task, but it is only after this task is performed that we end up with a model without holes that can accurately represent the given case. In this example, we use the patient's final prosthesis that we assembled the traditional way and imported it digitally. We then measured the distance from the incisor's edge to the bone on the anterior and posterior sides. We made sure that we had a minimum of 15 mm of prosthetic space. We defined the bone reduction needed at that mark. Notice the very intimate adaptation of the guide to the bone. This is crucial to ensure proper guide placement. Since this is an exclusively bone-supported guide, we are depending on this adaptation for an, an eventful surgery. A mucosupported guide will take advantage of the retromolar areas, but not here. For this to work properly, you need to define the insertion axis from the vestibular to the lingual. Next step was to construct a bone level guide that served as a reference for the bone reduction. It is of the utmost importance that the bone reduction is enough. It is also obviously important that we do not reduce more than needed this allows us for longer implants to be placed and saves bone for a future surgery, if needed. In order to stabilize this guide, we'll be using pins. These pins engage the maxillary or mandibular bone 
and ensure no movement occurs at the bone reduction guide. A perfect adaptation is the goal here. To achieve this, an insertion axis, again from the vestibular to limb wall, was selected, and as such, we should be able to see a close adaptation of this guide to the bone. After bone reduction is achieved, we constructed an implant placement guide that used the same guide holes as bone reduction. So we are using two guides in this example. This larger guide is easy to fabricate, but is somewhat bulky and it won't allow for visual control. It is also hard to irrigate, but it won't move. And so here you can see the implant placement and angulation following the lower teeth denture position. Here it is a very similar case, but on the maxilla. We went and used six pins on the vestibular. I would probably use less today because four will probably be enough. We once again can see a perfect adaptation. We ensure we have enough space for rehabilitation, use the guide for bone reduction, and then used a guide and not a guide. Um, again, we are using two guides here and we use the layer for a perfect implant placement. Another mandible and uh, again two guides. First, the bone reduction adapted to the mandibular bone through the use of bone pins. We did design another guide to direct the placement of our DOUF implants. This guide is going to be secured in place through pins going in in the same holes as the previous guide. Again, a bulky guide, but very rigid, so very little to no movement can be expected from it. We can do this case completely digitally, for sure, but I still like to start my cases having a traditional temporary denture by my side, the denture the patient will wear at the end of the surgery. What I like to do is import this denture digitally and create a sort of device that holds the denture on the correct spatial location, a device that is also fixed in place through the use of pins on the very same holes that were used for the other two guides. This allows me to be sure about the provisional prosthesis position, a common problem in Lone 4 because we are reducing bone and often mobilizing large flaps in the maxilla in the mandible. So we are sometimes extracting teeth and uh, all of these results, all of these eliminates uh, anatomical references and makes the task of three-dimensionally aligning the denture very, very difficult. In this other example, magnets were used. Magnets are a great solution. You can find these in all shapes and sizes, and you can find magnets that exert an immense strength. So here we are using four magnets attached to the bone guide. These allow for easy seating and removal of another guide. However, without any kind of stop, it's very easy to dislodge them laterally. Other than that, they work beautifully and also are very inexpensive. The bone reduction guide will be left in place through all of the surgery. The implant placement guide will sit on the bone reduction guide and we can easily remove it for checking or for irrigation. Here we have it, a beautiful reduction. This guide is sitting on the retromolar bone for added stability, that being the reason why we also have a lingual component. The same concept here in this case. Again, the use of magnets. This time a slight variation. The implant placement guide is slightly thinner, sort of minimal, structural even. Easier to check the implant's position, easier to irrigate, but of course more fragile. These guides will work very well if you were the one who has designed them. As the guides become thinner, less bulky, they're also much more prone to bending, move or break. So please bear that in mind when considering these more tubular, naked guides. Here's another example of um, a skeleton guide, similar to those before. Three magnets and four pins here. 
we assembled a reduction guide based on the final prosthesis. Here you can see the reduced maxilla. Of course, these cases need to be searching for anchorage because we lose the crestal cortical by reducing bone. Once again, here you see me using the anchorage on the anterior implants to make sure we position the posterior implants just in the right place. Also, we are using a positioning guide, let's call it a positioning guide, that specially corrects the provisional denture on the correct position. In this example, we are using locators to connect the two guides. It's a solution that allows the guides to click in place and prevents them from moving, or at least it prevents the guide from being displaced laterally. One can use different retention on the locators, allowing the guide to be easily removed and relocated. This solution improves visibility and allows for easier irrigation. But a guide like this, and actually many of the previous guides, is a good guide for someone designing their own guides. As the structure becomes lighter, as we unclutter our view, it becomes absolutely necessary to have a deep understanding of the given guide, where you should be applying force, where you should refrain from doing so, where is it possible to bend, where to check for adaptation, etc. It is not the kind of guide you will be expecting from a guide producing company. The purpose of a company that produces guide is to deliver a bulletproof device that has very little to no space for mistakes. For that reason, they will be bigger, bulkier and use guide tubes. You'll notice that I am not using guide tubes. Lately, whenever I'm designing my own guides, I tend not to use them, as this allows me to use a smaller guide tube diameter hole, this being very important when performing surgery on narrow sites. It also helps when placing angled implants. Sometimes when the bore is entering the osteotomy at an incorrect angle, our bore get stuck inside the guide tube. This may actually be a great safety feature, making it near impossible to place the implant incorrectly, but nonetheless, it can also be a complete drag to solve during our surgery. Yet another variation, this time using multi-unit abutments. This, uh, this way we can actually screw the guide in place, ensuring that no movement happens. Great visibility and stability, no sliding whatsoever. Is a downside harder to remove quickly if needed, although only two screws need to be used. We did both the maxilla and the mandible here. Like we have mentioned, the design process involved in these guys can be quite complex, time-consuming and prone to errors. So it's only natural that we search for simpler alternatives. Like in all fields in the industry, there are many paths to roam. So what happens if we take a, deeper, a different path and start experimenting with other approaches? This is a mucosupported guide in a fairly atrophic uh, maxillary case. Despite having treated several cases with osteosupported guides, guides that have their support in bone, I am very well aware that planning a case that way is much more complex because it always involves segmentation of the maxilla or mandible, that is manually indicating the software if the selected area is bone or not. By being a human-mediated process, it's of course prone to error, and it's also a tedious and often hard task. Also, the cases tend to be more traumatic to the patient as the procedures often take longer. So for this case, 
I planned using a mucus supported guide to place the implants first on their plant position and only then would I remove bone. This is a super simple but predictable option. Whenever possible, this seems to me to be the perfect approach. Easy to plan, allows for soft tissue manipulation, only one guide is needed, fast, with the visual confirmation of the implant position. However, in some cases, we have to reduce a lot of bone, then the implants may have to be placed very apically, and therefore, in many cases, the offset may be too large for the current guided kit. Okay, a few words on bone level guides before we finish. First, the obvious, what is a bone level guide? Well, any guide that lays against the bone is a bone level guide. Now, we may have guides that exclusively rest against the bone or guides that, for example, sit on teeth and at the bone at the same time for extra safety and precision. Typically, I may use these guides on sinus lift, apicoectomies, bone reduction, such as the one you saw me doing on the previous chapter. I might also be doing guides for bone collection. What are the benefits of these guides? Well, it depends on the surgery, but in a nutshell, it will allow you to precisely find or avoid a given anatomical location. Let's take sinus lift. On sinus lift, you can identify the anterior artery, avoiding it completely, or you can perform your enterostomy on the perfect location. This means having bone all around, ensuring that you can easily manage a perforation should it occur. On bone collection guides, I will ensure that you remove just the perfect amount of bone. You don't want to be collecting bone from uh, the ramus and end up with less than an ideal amount. On the other hand, if there is no need for a large bone graft, then any extra bone removal is just additional trauma necessary. So a guide will help you remove just the right amount while keeping you away from the alveolar nerve and adjacent teeth roots. Particularly if you are beginning, this may help you greatly, as it is an easy way for you to be sure about the location and size of your graph. We use it all the time in an academic context as an effective way of communication between my students and me. Are there any downsides with these guys? Well, for sure, some of these may become too bulky in size, so in order to easily accommodate these guys on the bone, one must raise a larger flap. So, so we will typically extend your incisions when dealing with these guys. Also, they can be quite time consuming since you will need to segment your cases. If the benefits outweigh the downsides, it's up to you. On this image, we can see some guys designed to collect bone from the mandibular symphysis in both ramus. You'll notice the, these devices that lie against the bone being secured in place with the osteosynthesis screws. Here you can see a guide designed to collect bone from the ramus inside the guide. You will use a piezo device for this. Lately, I am moving away from this configuration because the outer boundaries can break because they are inserted next to the masseter muscle. In order for them not to break, one needs to create them bulkier, which is a downside. Also, because we are working on the inside, the guide takes more space than the actual graft. A simple rectangle configuration like this is more resistant and also saves spaces because the outer boundary is to be projected as the ostomy line. An osteosynthesis screw can be used. In some situations, no screw can also be an option. This will allow for the outer limits to be sketched in the bone using a pencil and remove the guide, thus the surgery becoming simpler because of the available space and the uncluttered view. Here is a bone level guide that you can use to collect bone from the symphysis. Um, on the left, a smaller graft is to be collected using the same space as the guide on the right. Same situation here. Well, here you have it. A guide that uses teeth, actually just the vestibular part of the teeth for anchorage, also doubles as an implant placement guide and a guide for bone graft collection from the retromolar area. You can see the perfect fit of the guide, 
this was designed having into account the anatomical boundaries uh, you would normally consider in such a procedure, namely the proximity of the alveolar nerve and the adjacent teeth. We're also taking into account the cortical and medullar part of this graft, so that we end up with an easily collectible graft. The last thing you want to do is struggle to collect the graft once this osteotomy is performed. Here is our osteotomy, performed accordingly to the guides. Interior rectangle. Here is our curry graph in its final position, a thin shell of, of cortical exterior bone creating a boundary and an immobile uh, separation from the scraped particular content that one can find in the inside. This is actually the idea behind the curry technique. The osteopotential of the particulated graft acting as uh, osteogenic islands uh, that promote bone formation. The outside cortical bone purpose is to prevent uh, soft tissue infiltration, also to prevent any movement uh, that can be passed to the graft itself. It's possible uh, to place implants at the same time, provided that we have enough initial stability, and that's just what we did. At six months, we can find vascularized bleeding bone in front of our implants. In order to support a guide here, and another implant placement guide also, we place our implants on the correct plan location. And here we have a guide that indicates us the perfect location to collect our graft from, while being supported by one tooth, easy to design, easy to find space for it in the mouth. We use the piezoelectric device to perform the osteotomy, as we often do. And uh, we proceed to collect the graft with the help of a chisel. The intimate relation with the collection guide is remarkable. In the back, um, the part that sits on the tooth. These techniques imply the use of particulated bone, which we achieve through the use of a bone scraper. We scrape the collection, the collected bone, until we obtain enough bone to compact the surgical site. You are then left with uh, this bone plate, which we remove any angles from. And there we have it. We screw it at a distance and pack the inside with the scraped bone. In this case, we obtained a vertical stop for our guide by using the anterior teeth. We are not using screws here or any kind of fixation, so we must be sure that uh, this will be immobile during the surgery. This is where we will be placing our graft. Once again, screwing the plate at a distance and packing the scraped bone inside. Yet another case, we need to graft the vestibular of this molar site. So we went and designed our guide with a stop on the molar. We also needed some sinus grafting for sure. This is our guide in place using a tooth as anchorage. You can see the graft collection was just as planned. We split the graft using a disc. The sinus has a cirrhosis which we remove by aspiration. Once the cirrhosis is reduced in its size, we can remove it using pliers. Proceeded with the sinus lift and uh, here we have our graft. Uh, thank you for everything. Thank you for uh, having attended this webinar. If you have any questions, please let me know. And uh, cheers.